Welcome back to The Breakfast. Uh, moving on to a totally different conversation now. We, of course, uh, are going to be talking today in history, the 27th of November, a couple of years ago. Um, but we're starting with an interview this morning because we have a very, um, I believe, a very interesting conversation that we need to start up with uh, this morning. And it's from Ghana. Um, in 2019, the president, Nana Akufuado, uh, celebrated the year of return. And um, it was, of course, in commemoration of uh, a 400 years of slavery, the day that the very first ship left, uh, I think it's called the Gold Coast in Ghana, and took slaves away from um, Africa. Um, 2019, the president decided that it was time that they... They actually announced it in September of 2018 at the celebration of special ceremony to, you know, give citizenship to about 125 people, people yes. um, was done. Since the country's independence, to be um, fair, um, the leaders have initiated policies geared towards attracting Africans who are in the diaspora, diaspora. back home. Um, let's talk to our guest now. Um, he's Mr. Kent uh, Mensah. He's uh, AFP uh, Ghana correspondent. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on the program this morning. Talk to us. Um, why is this celebration necessary? It's been ongoing. Has there been any success? Yes, um, I must say that um, the year of return was one of the biggest um, events ever um, last year, especially when it comes to um, the hospitality industry and then also um, our culture. Basically, it put Ghana on the global um, limelight because one, we are talking about slavery, which is one of the biggest um, topics ever um, when, when it comes to Africa and then um, our relationship with the rest of the world. So basically, our president thought of, um, <coughs> sorry, our president thought of, why don't we connect um, with our brothers and sisters who are living in the diaspora, especially in the Caribbean and in the U.S., and then um, try to give them options to come back home so that they will come and then um, invest and also live with the people over here. So it was one of the greatest because um, Ghana was able to rake in 1.9 billion dollars that is huge money because it was a booming business for most of the hotels it was a booming business for most of the tourist centers it was also um, an opportunity and um, so to speak for the locals to also have an interaction with most of the people who are living out there for some of them it was a spiritual journey as well because they are coming back to have a look at where their ancestors were kept before they were moved from Ghana to the Jamestown in some part of the U.S. and then other part of the Caribbean. So it was a whole mix of um, um, emotional uh, journey for them. Apart from the economic gains, we also had the um, emotional connection with our people. And as you rightly stated, 200, as, as, as we speak now, where uh, people were given citizenship in, in Ghana uh, last year, and most of them have been able to acquire lands. Most of them are also um, bringing in um, investors, setting up businesses over here. I know some people, um, when I spoke to the Ghana um, African American Association in Ghana here, they are telling me that a lot of their people are asking how are they able to also come and settle in Ghana because they believe that it is about time. Because All right, let's talk when about... you look at the cultural setting, they think that Africans have a proper way of upbringing when it comes to teaching their children how to live than Fair living enough. in a country Let, where... Let's talk about, um, um, about obviously, and... obviously it has been um, a good move by the government over the years. Um, we know for a fact that um, Ghana was a major um, uh, route for the transatlantic um, slave trade. And we know today that illegal migration continues. Do you have situation like we have in Nigeria, where a lot of people embark uh, on perilous journey that they are not even sure they would survive just to get out to other climes. Do you have that scenario in Ghana today? We have a lot. We have a lot of a situation where the youth believe that, look, they can make it better in life when they migrate to the Western world because they see the place as where there are greener pastures. So we have had issues of stowaways. We have had issues of people trying to fake 
uh, passport just to make sure that they migrate or leave the country. So I think this is a, 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 an African phenomenon, especially for the youth, whereas um, those in the diaspora think that it is about time they move here, the youth of today are thinking about quick cash. So they think that they can easily make it there. They know about the um, threats. They know about, I mean, moving on the high seas, the dangers and everything involved. They have been watching TV, looking at the perilous situation of African American, uh, sorry, Africans who were um, no, no, arrested no, no, no. in some it, part it, of On the Spain, one hand, Egypt, on the Africa. one hand, uh, Mr. Mensa, uh, it seems there is progress. The government is attracting people back. And then on the other hand, you you are painting a scenario of young people who still believe that in spite of government efforts to bring other uh, Africans in diaspora home, there is need to leave the country. Is it that it has to do with the economic realities still on the ground? What is the government doing to encourage young people to stay in the country other than engage in this um, uh, journey? Well, we've had um, situations where government have promised time and over that um, they are going to, there's going to be job creation, but the youth believe that the kind of um, economic situation that we have in the country now does not make it easily uh, available for them to um, start their own jobs. Because um, and even if they are to start their own jobs, these are jobs that um, government officials are coming to take taxes on them. So we've, um, you know, we have... Um, 11 days to the election or 10 days to the election. So now um, parties are promising that, look, we are giving startups like eight years um, tax holidays, 10 years tax holidays, just to make sure that the youth can start their own jobs um, where governments will not put pressure on them taking taxes. But even with that, I think the youth are not ready. They think that they can make it better okay. in somewhere in America or somewhere in Europe and not in Africa. Kent Mensa, um, I'm, I'm going to go back to some of the things that you had already spoken um, on. Um, on uh, Ghana making about $1.5 billion from, you know, 1.9 billion dollars, I beg your pardon, from uh, the year of return. I remember uh, the whole of last year, um, there was a lot of, you know, craziness about returning home to the motherland. Uh, there was so many celebrities who, you know, were interested, who visited, who, um, of course, uh, um, um, spoke about it. People started even going back to looking for their roots and seeing what part of Africa that they truly were, were from. And I'm talking about Af African-Americans now. Um, but I want, you know, your thoughts on whether this truly was um, to kickstart and to be a reminder about um, slavery and where it all started from, or it was about tourism. Um, which of them truly was Nana Kufuado's focus here? Um, was he trying to remind people about the, the issue of slavery and what uh, Africans went through? Or was he targeting tourism? That's one. Another thing is, many people argue that African-American celebrities and the likes simply just use Africa for optics. They don't really care about what happens down here or about the lives of Ghanaians or Nigerians or you know, Africans here. Um, it's really just for optics. Do you agree with that? Okay, so um, to start with, I think that um, the, for, for your first question, um, purely the main aim of the year of return was, was for economic gains because the government was trying to find ways of um, injecting a, a fresh cash into the system so that they, um, we will make a lot of um, benefits economically. So you know that people are a lot of people are coming back into the country, and then we had um, about two hundred thousand increase in arrivals alone. That amounted to um, I think seven hundred and uh, seven hundred fifty thousand arrivals in total in the country for 2019. So it tells you the amount of money that was injected into the economy. Um, from the hospitality sector into other sectors as well. So it was purely for economic gains because um, I, I, I must be blunt here that people in this country or in Africa per se do not really care about the issue about slavery because we, we, we are like, look, we are thinking about our pockets. So whatever happened, um, some time passed, we don't really care about it. That is why a lot of the youth are trying to go to Europe or whatever it is. They don't see it as modern day type of slavery that's for them to go there they are not interested in it now to your second question i think that it's it's, it's a 50 50 sort of thing for um, a celebrity in europe 
he is thinking of coming um, down here or, or, or um, getting some optics out of um, the kind of thing they do with Africans because he is also looking at what sort of branding is he able to get outside his comfort zone so that he will be able to he or she will be able to also um, have a niche of followership in Africa because whether we like it or not, a lot of their uh, music, a lot of their movies are down here. So they need to also make sure that they have their market down here for, for branding purposes. So it's, it's, it's two ways for them to um, top of mind awareness about their brand and also um, taking advantage of the situation here and see how best they can cash in on, on that. So All it right. is up to us as Africans Mr. to also Mr. see Ken. how beneficial, how, how we are going to also cash in on their coming here to also make sure that it is a win-win situation. All right, Mr. All Kentman, right. Um, thank you very much for joining us and uh, talking to us about uh, Ghana's uh, year of return. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, interesting uh, submission there, actively looking to grow the economy. Uh, I would want to talk more about that, but we have to look at other things that happened today uh, in history. Uh, let's talk about um, Omar Bongo. Bongo. The, this <laughs> story starts, and, and uh, before you go on, this story is from Gabon. It starts very much like the you know regular African story of you know person holding on to power forever. But at the end of the story, you know where it says that you know he eventually died. You would expect that maybe it might be different, but it continues by saying that his son took over. So don't expect any <laughs> happy endings in this story. <laughs> All right, so let's just give you a quick um, uh, background, or should I say, why we're talking about it today. On this day in 2005, he was re-elected for um, another seven-year term. Before then, he had spent over 20 years already um, in power. So you can imagine that the Constitution was... Um, tweaked, so to speak, to get him um, in. He eventually died in power after 41 years on June 8, 2009. But there are unconfirmed reports that he actually died a day before the government officially uh, announced it. He was originally born um, as Albert Bernard Bongo. But he became, um, he, he converted to Islam um, in 1973 and chose the first name Umar, and that's how he was known. Interestingly, like Osauge um, highlighted, um, his son, who was the defense minister uh, in, in, in around 2008-2009, emerged as the candidate of the same party. Remember, the country had decades of a single party single system, party system yeah. before they now had the, the constitution reviewed and they now had a multi-party system. Even then, his son became um, the candidate, is currently uh, the president of Gabon. So, uh, like you said, it's just a replay of what has been happening. There's been efforts, there's been agitation. We know that after the election, um, opposition came up and said, uh, they did not accept the result, and but at the end of the day, court ruled it's, um, that uh, it is, he was. Uh, it's, it's, it's a story that you know would be shocking, you know, knowing that people have lived all their lives um, under the leadership of one family. It has mm -hmm. been you yeah, know, people the, have been born family. and died, yes, and exactly. been born and died. He has been in. He was in power for forty-one, forty-two years before he died. Um, longer than Fidel Castro, longer than um, uh, Yoweri uh, Museveni of uh, Uganda, longer than Paul Bia in Cameroon. And th these are some of the people that you would you know, know very popularly across the world as the longest seven African leaders. But Omar Bongo, you know, outlived them you know, in his uh, stay in uh, office. Um, his son currently is president. He did about the same things that uh, most African presidents do, and that is tweak the constitution every now and then to favor their own political journeys. And so it is, um, there's also, you know, the details of the, the relationship between Gabon and France and how yes, France how also France played always, a, yes, a yes. major role in keeping him in power. The, the funny um, thing um, that I also uh, noticed was the fact that they, they both got sick uh, while in power. He died after he got sick 
And now his son, uh, sometime in 2008, there were rumors that he was also ill. And that led to, for the first time, they had to touch the Constitution again to allow the vice president to uh, stand in his stead. But he recovered and he's back okay. um, in power. Interesting development um, in um, Congo. Uh, <laughs> um, I just, there's so much we would like to share, but time Sadly, is always... Sadly, he also died in Spain. Uh, um, yes. After spending 42 years um, in office. Um, okay. Still couldn't fix a hospital in Gabon that could take care of his health challenges. Same story. Same story. <laughs> Nothing has changed. This would always today. crack me up. 42 years, still couldn't fix a hospital in Gabon that could take care of his health care. Well, quite unfortunate. All right. Uh, let's look at um, another um, event. Today would have been the 80th birthday of Bruce Lee. Ching, ching, ching. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember him. Um, when you, when, and then those sound, those soundtrack. Go, go. From the 70s. From the 70s. I would, I, would, I would confess, before we get into this, I'll confess that I never saw any Bruce Lee movies. Oh, I did. I always did. just knew the name. I did, he on was, black uh, and white. Was, I uh, did. He was a legend. But the thing is, he inspired a lot of the people that I grew up with as my own movie legends. The likes of Chuck Norris, the likes of uh, Van Damme, Steven Seagal, and, and, you know, the likes. Um, he inspired, and his movies inspired a lot of these people. He basically made kung fu movies a thing in the United States, and that is where the likes of Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal and, and um, you know, the like Jet Li later on, Ch uh, Jackie Chan, of course, a lot later on, um, all came from the inspiration of, um, of Bruce Lee. Yeah, um, the, the, was a the, phenomenal, the, phenomenal personality. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the, the sad thing was his early demise. Uh, still didn't stop, meaning you can achieve anything you want to achieve. And then there is this um, phobia he allegedly had about always talking dying young and that eventually happened there's a lot of conspiracy around his death but what we know that there was an autopsy carried out and the reason for his death uh, was very clear let's just uh, give you a little uh, background he was a child actor in hong kong and um, later moved to the u.s with his family he grew up and thought uh, martial arts okay he also starred in the tv series the green hornet uh, it ran from 1966 to um, 67 and became a major box office draw in the Chinese connection and the most uh, favorite of all, Fists of Fury. Um, uh, he died shortly after uh, the release. He, oh, the, there was also Enter the Dragon. Okay, um, let's talk a bit about... He, he, he thought people, like you said, he thought people the act of self-defense. He made it fun. He made it entertaining. And those his screams uh, were legendary. You don't need to know. The soundtrack tells you um, when he is coming on. Um, he got married. He had two children. Yes. And we understand one of his daughters keeps the, uh, you know, the uh, flame alive. Um, he... Let me see uh, the information I have here. The posthumous release of Enter the Dragon, his status as a film icon was uh, confirmed. The film, um, said to have a budget of just $1 million, went on to gross more than $200 million. That's phenomenal so that's by, by any standards. You know, um, his legacy helped pave the way for the likes that you mentioned, Jackie Chan. Um, his life was depicted in 1993 um, in the film Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, based on The Man Only I Knew, um, a memoir by his wife, Linda Lee. And in 2009, a documentary, How Bruce Lee Changed the World, we also had something in the summer of uh, 2013. Uh, the Hong Kong Heritage Museum opened the exhibition Bruce Lee Kung Fu at Life. Interesting legend. Very interesting. Very, Sad very. that he, you know, only uh, had 32 I, years on Each Earth. time I hear, um, the, the, the other thing that um, um, brings that sound to my mind is when you hear um, Tales by Moonlight, those soundtrack you unforgettable he's on his gun gun <laughs> i never I, i'll be honest i never saw any, any and then yeah what's your point never <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what that means <laughs> i just love it even now randomly you could see it on some uh, channels on dstv you just 
you know, just watch it and laugh and reminisce on what happened. Okay. So on this day, a legend was born and um, he died also a legend. Bruce Lee, the man a lot of people will remember uh, when you talk about Kung Fu. He's, uh, of course, known as Let's the most in influential. Let's try something now. Let me give you... <laughs> I would so beat you up. <laughs> oh, no, ah, don't don't try my kung fu skills. We we we. <laughs> he is considered the most influential martial artist of all time. Sad that he died, um, very young, aged thirty two. But, but of course, the things that he was able to achieve in the time that he was alive and at the time he was in the industry would outlive um, him. I well, can never outlive him, but would go on for centuries. Um, he would always be a legend. He would always be, of course, one of the people who inspired um, some other legends. And, and so today we're celebrating um, Bruce Lee. Um, he died of a cerebral edema, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I, th um, I, I actually... Actually, um, checked it out. Let me see if I can it's find a, it. Was it. A, it was a swelling mm. in the brain um, that brain edema. Yeah, yeah found an aut in the autopsy that was conducted. Um, a strange reaction, according to investigations, to a prescription painkiller. Um, he was reportedly taking at the time for a back injury. Um, that's about it for today in history. We've talked about Umar Bongo. Uh, they have. They seem to have a generational transition of power the father died in power we have the son uh, there now i hope son have any male of... kids sorry does the son have any male kids i, I, guess uh, I actually didn't pay attention to the son's life i just knew need to find uh, out that my, uh, he succeeded his father and the party that they uh, collaborated in founding uh, still holds sway in that country we're hoping that the people will be liberated and get um, leader but to be fair to be fair I read that um, he has made some strides. He's been commended for efforts to help, you know, regrow the economy, make life a little easier for people. Uh, but the bigger wow. picture is that also there is still poverty. <laughs> They're already rich. I mean, I mean, there's also <laughs> there's, reports There's of this him. conversation about people saying, um, my generation of my gener uh, generation of my generation of my family will never suffer because I've made more than enough to care for. They don't even need to work. And that's what you see in Africa. African, uh, um, people are making and planning for children that are yet to be born, not considering the fact that these children need to find their part, need to grow on their own, I mean, make history um, on their own as well, instead of leaving off the you know, the legends of their family created. Gabon should probably just be renamed to Bongo. If we're being honest, it really should just be renamed to Bongo. If if it's also very likely that um, the people wouldn't be able to, or the government itself uh, wouldn't be able to take the power away from that family, um, if the current president and they probably need to find out about that has a son that is also growing up, I'm sure that they also uh, very <laughs> likely, you know, uh, trying to push you know this that thing direction. about um, going with what you know and the power of um, the staying power of people who controlled a lot of, control a lot of loyalty. As much as there are concerns about the welfare of the country, how the um, economy is growing, you will see there are die-hard fans, just like you have in Nigeria, that are in the seat of power that will do anything to make sure their principal remain in power. If you know you are one of them, change your Nerves ways. <laughs> also, change um, your ways and be a good critic of your principles so that real change can come to the people. Yeah. Um, some other thing, you know, that I would quickly mention it, um, and it's one of the reasons I asked um, um, Kent Menta that question. Um, I, I understand how profitable it has been for Ghana, um, setting up the year of return, massively, you know, um, uh, pro profitable for the country and for Africa. I remember that there was so much tourism to Africa in 2019, mostly because of that. You know, and the conversation about oh, where are my roots? Opera had to go check hers. Uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, you know, did the same thing. Ludacris did the same thing. Um, Steve Harvey did the same thing. It was so popular back then. Um, but I always have that fear that a lot of these people just use Africa for optics. You know, it's never because they care about the people I down here. Or they, I disagree with you. I disagree with you. Even their I action, feel. even their action I'm, I'm, prior to them going to their countries, uh, show some of them have lots of work that they do in Africa. <sighs> you see them, people like, um, for instance, Angelina Jolie might not be an African, but how yeah, many but kids does she have that came from I'm, the country? I'm, Would you say that is optics as well? That's that's. Oh, it depends on. It 
interpretation? It's really, for me, yes, Angelina Jolie, and I'm not talking, she's white. I'm not talking to her, and I'm talking about the black Africans. So somebody the like um, Idris Elba, would you would say, is looking and for... Not, I'm, I'm not going to name any person in particular, but I feel like a lot of the, the conversations about Africa, the conversations about going to the motherland, they always mention, they always say those things. If you remember also when George Floyd... I, would, I wouldn't dispute I, I would that there are this, people... When George Floyd, Floyd died and the U.S. Democratic Party um, was somehow trying to um, align with the African Americans and all of that, what they did was to go carry Kinti um, and put it on their, on their necks to take up uh, some um, photo shoot Well, like in that, every which scenario, was, which... there will always be people who want to exploit it. But I would uh, believe that these people, um, if you check most of the celebrities that I know of that got uh, citizenship here in Africa, have a history of investing, coming home, mm. working to help uh, the... Uh, I mean, I'm not as discrediting the NGOs and the you know the people who have actually put in money into healthcare and malaria and, and the likes, but you know I, I, those things you know still very much exist. I'm just saying that a lot of these conversations that I hear from that side, for me, just really looks like you know things. It's it's just optics. It's never really right. an in-depth love for the African um, continent or for Africans themselves. You, that's, you why, also, that's why. If you also look at, um, I'm sorry, if you also look at the way that a lot of African Americans treat real core Africans from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Sierra Leone, you would also still see a lot of racism in those small circles. Well, Hello. It's a conversation. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.